Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2019 Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Tyrrell Museum and its Cooperating Society are pleased to welcome back a regular guest of the Speaker Series, Dr. John Node. John is a petroleum geologist based in Calgary, working for Grand Tierra Energy. John obtained his undergraduate degree from Imperial College in London, England. After working as a mining geologist in South Africa and as a marine geologist planning undersea cable route for British telecom companies in the UK, John completed a master's degree in sedimentology with his thesis focusing on the fluvial sequence stratigraphy of Dinosaur Provincial Park. Upon completing his thesis, John returned to the University of London to pursue his PhD on the sedimentary evolution of Eastern Borneo. After completing his PhD, John was lured by oil companies and over the years has worked on a variety of Middle Eastern and Canadian exploration projects. He has worked for a variety of oil companies over the years and through it all, John has always been and remains to this day a real paleontology enthusiast. Today, John will present a talk on the most famous of all fossil birds, Archaeopteryx. So without further delay, I present you Dr. John Node. Thanks, Francois. Well, good morning, everybody. T today I'm going to talk to you about uh, Archaeopteryx, and uh, I hope that most of you are familiar with this bird. It's probably the most famous bird in the world, and the reason for this is that when it was discovered back in the 1860s, it was the a fossil bird that came from the Jurassic period, which was way earlier than any other fossil bird material that had ever been discovered. So this is a picture of uh, the Berlin specimen of Archaeopteryx, which I, I have down here as well. I brought in to show you this specimen. Now, obviously, this is not the real one. Otherwise, it would be worth probably around $100 million or so. But uh, <laughs> this is to give you an idea of the size of this animal. Uh, the, the first body specimen that was found of Archaeopteryx was uh, back in 1861. And it was named Archaeopteryx, which means old wing. And you can see very clearly why that is with these beautiful wings that have been preserved on this specimen here, the Berlin specimen. It lived around 150 million years ago in the late Jurassic in southern Germany. And this was at the same time as various other fo famous fossil deposits, like uh, those ones from the Morrison Formation with Diplodocus in them, and the ones from uh, T uh, Tanzania with Brachiosaurus and, and Kentrosaurus and Stegosaurus. So a lot of these animals were living around the same time. But at the time that all of these dinosaurs had been found, no one had any idea that there were birds living as well at that time until these specimens were first discovered. It's around the size of a magpie, as you can see from the cast here, weighs around one kilogram, and it's possibly able to fly or glide, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but it also has many features which are more representative of small dinosaurs. And one of the fascinating things about this fossil is that there are only 12 specimens known, and because there's been so much interest in this animal, they are extremely familiar to everybody, and each of those specimens has its own name. So today we're going to look at the environment in which our bird lived, the specimens, some of their stories and the morphology, the, the, the types of the structures that they have within their bodies. And we're going to look at the day-to-day -day lifestyle of the world's most famous fowl. So let's start off with the depositional setting. And uh, the Solnhofen limestone is located on a high plateau just to the north of Munich. And rivers there cut through hundreds of meters of late Jurassic limestones, including the Solnhofen limestone. And as you can see from these photographs here, this limestone is extremely thinly laminated. And this allows it to be split into these microscopically thin layers. So initially this was used as a, a building stone, and then they realized that it was such high quality, so fine-grained and so perfectly preserved that they could use it for printing as well. So because they've done all of this work and they've split so many thousands and millions of pieces of this limestone, this has led to the discovery of some amazing fossils as well. So the fossils are actually very, very scarce, but it's just that these quarries have been working since the 1820s. And so over that time, they found a lot of fossils. And the preservation of these fossils, because the rock is so fine-grained, is absolutely outstanding. And I just want to point out here that this is my daughter. When we went to Solnhofen many years ago, she's 23 now, but she's busy uh, looking for Archaeopteryx in the quarries there. And you can still go there today and look for these fossils. So at the time of deposition, so as I said, 
Over here in the States, in the Morrison Formation, we had these large dinosaurs and down in, in Tanzania as well. But Solnhofen at that time was sitting at about, in this area here, was sitting at about 25 to 30 degrees north. So it was a nice subtropical climate, warm, semi-arid. And uh, we've got evidence from things like these belemnites here and also from the carbonate deposition that the temperature was around 26 degrees C. So it was really beautiful lifestyle for these animals. There's not a lot of indication of any runoff of sediment from the land deposits, so you don't see anything mixed in with these, these carbonate rocks. And that suggests that we didn't have a lot of um, precipitation in the area, so it was fairly dry. And the kind of plants that we find in these deposits, like this lovely conifer here, are also suggesting relatively dry conditions. So what we had in, in the Solnhofen world was that you had small islands dotted around in a big lagoonal area, and then a large sea sitting to the south, which is called the Tethys Ocean, so this giant ocean that extended down way over the equator. And then to, to the east and then also to the north, we had some more land deposits as well. So you have to imagine this area here with these nice lagoonal deposits, which are shown in blue here, and then little odd islands that are sitting in between them. So within those lagoons, you were having this deposits of these really fine-grained sediments. And so this is what the seabed might have looked like back there. Uh, very, very fine-grained, kind of muddy deposits. You remember when, if you've ever been on holiday and you walk into this beautiful-looking lagoon and all of the, the mud squidges up around your feet, that's the kind of environment that we're in at this point. And you find a variety of fauna in here, and we'll have a look later on at the, the range of fauna, but we find both marine forms, which have fl probably washed in or swum in from the south, from, the, from this Tethys Ocean, and we also find terrestrial animals, so like Archaeopteryx and some of its uh, re relatives as well. So a very lagoonal atmosphere and a lot of uh, quite muddy deposits. So when you go and look at these lagoons in more detail, what you find is that the, the lagoons were really not a very nice place to be. So we had a nice open marine area to the south where these animals were having a great time. But when the animals made their way into the lagoons, parts of the lagoons were very stagnant and very toxic. And you had a lot of evaporation going on as well, which created very high salinities. So you would literally have situations where the animals would swim into the lagoonal area and just about die on the spot. So first of all, you end up with a lot of marine animals which have died. But the other nice thing for us is that it means that when animals like Archaeopteryx, if they flew into this area and then died, and died in the lagoon, when they fell down to the bottom of the sea, instead of being scavenged by lots of predators, small animals, gastropods, and bivalves, these corpses would just lie on the lagoon bed and just have the chance to fossilize absolutely perfectly. And I put this picture in here. This is some experiments that were done to try and recreate the Solnhofen world, where they put dead frogs into tanks, and they created the chemistry to match what we think was going on in the late Jurassic. And you can see that these frogs here were gradually coated by bacteria, these cyanobacterial mats, and then and covered up. And so the mats were helping to preserve them. So you'd have this bacterial mats that would cover up the specimens. And then you'd have a very fine-grained rain of sediment that would finish them off and would create the fossils. And you actually end up where, if you look at a bed of this limestone, you'll see a bed like this. And then there'll just be a little bump, a little pedestal, where the actual fossil is preserved. And this example here, this is just showing one of a beautiful horseshoe crab that has, it's in a death, death spiral. So what it's done, it was wandering along quite happily on the lagoon bed, and then it en entered one of these toxic areas, and then it just took its last faltering steps before it just died at that point. And you see that a lot. You actually see fish in the process of eating animals which have just been fossilized on the spot. So what, let's have a look at what it might have looked like at that time, and we can see what kind of world we were in. So this is Sonhofen in the late Jurassic. This is not my reconstruction, but I think it paints a very nice picture of what was going on at the time. So we had these scattered islands here in a nice lagoonal situation. Here is the lagoon sitting in here, and then this would be the Tethys Sea out here. So you can imagine fish that would be swimming in through these gaps here between the rocks, and as they come in, then they're just basically passing out due to the toxic nature of the sediment. So on, as far as the land deposits go, it's a relatively arid environment. I've got this picture here from northern Australia, which I think provides quite a good idea of what, what, what it might have been like at the time, with some scattered vegetation along the coast, but fairly dry inland of that. 
Looking at modern analogs, when you, when you look in the, the literature and, and you look for suggestions, uh, one, of the thing, one of the places they suggest is in the Gulf of Mexico. And halfway down the edge of the Gulf of Mexico, as you're going into deeper water, you get these little ponds of very, very saline deposits, where also evaporation has led to these very salt-rich ponds that are sitting on the seabed. And they are known as the jacuzzis of despair, which I think is a beautiful term. So... For our, for our purposes, these are, I think they're too deep water. And another nice analogue is looking at Shark Bay, which is in Western Australia. And here you're also seeing hypersaline lagoons. And you've got these lagoons here, which are often at least twice normal salinity levels, high evaporation rates, and you don't get a lot of fresh water coming in because it is a very dry, arid sort of area. And it, what's going on in Western Australia is that you've got a lot of these stromatolites. So this is another type of bacterial deposit that's forming, that, that's growing in place. So in, in our Solnhofen example from uh, Germany, from the Jurassic, we're seeing more mats, bacterial mats. But here we're actually seeing the growth of these stromatolytic bodies, these big rounded bodies. But otherwise, it's really quite a similar environment. And what you also find, and I talked to a guy who did his PhD on this area just to, to ask him, is that you do find animals which are getting that are dying out in the, in the shallow waters here that are often very well preserved as well. So he actually said that he saw some shark skeletons and shark, shark bodies which were still preserved on, on the seabed in this area. So let's have a look at some of the key specimens of Archaeopteryx and pretty much everything we know, as I said, comes from 12 specimens and possibly from one extra feather as well that have been found. So, and of these, New classification systems have meant that not, not even all of these are now classified as Archaeopteryx themselves. So no surprises here. No two of these specimens are really the same. And you can see this. I, I've just drawn some sketches here just to show you roughly what each of these fossils looks like. And you can see that they form a kind of growth series. They're small ones and bigger ones. So this is the, probably the youngest one, the Eichstatt specimen. And then the, the, the the London specimen is probably the most mature, and this one is also quite a large animal here, the Solhofen specimen. But they form a kind of growth series through time, but we haven't found any babies, and we haven't found any eggs. And the reason for this is that we haven't really found the land deposits to go with our lagoons. And this is a problem in terms of behave, sorting out the behavior of Archaeopteryx, because normally you'd be hoping to see footprints and things like that, and we don't have a lot of those trace fossils and eggs and things like that. So a lot of what we know about their behavior, we've had to just determine from supposition and from using analogs to other animals. So you'll see that as we go on. So the preservation varies widely in these specimens, and it varies in terms of the degree of articulation, so how well their bones are joined together in the fossils. The degree of completeness, some of them are not very complete at all, as we'll see particularly in one specimen, and the orientation that their bodies formed when they, they landed on the lagoon bed. So this was the quilling news, quilling news where the first feather was found back in 1861, and this took the world by storm. If you can imagine one feather creating news across the world, this was that feather, because it was the first evidence of birds in the Jurassic that had ever been discovered. Consists of two counter slabs, so these are the two sides, which are now stored in different museums. And you can see by looking at this feather, if you follow the kind of the quill as it goes up through the feather, that it's very asymmetric. And asymmetric is good because that usually suggests that you've got a wing feather with the capabilities of flight. Much like if you have an aircraft, an aircraft wings, if you look at the wings and take a section through them and look at them, they are not symmetrical. Otherwise, they wouldn't work in terms of providing lift to the, to the plane. There was some evidence of a pattern on these feathers, possibly with light and dark spots like a partridge or a hawk. And they seem to have been preserved also by these microbial mats. And they were described by this gentleman, Hermann von Meyer, in 1861. And he had some reservations about whether the feather was from a bird, but he had already seen one of our skeletons that we're going to look at in a minute, which gave him some background information to suppose that this probably was from a bird. Anyway... Back in 2018, so last year, they, they used a new technique to look at this feather called laser-stimulated fluorescence. And the results were only published last month. So this is hot off the presses. And what they found was that they were able to see this is what the feather looks like in white light. This is what it looks like in the old drawing. But this is what it looks like with this image. And you can actually see the quill, the pointy quill here, extending. So this would have been the bit that's stuck into the animal to, to hold it in place. And what they found was that this quill does not have the right shape to be a bird feather. 
So this famous feather that was named Archaeopteryx, ancient wing, and was all supposed to be from the first bird, actually turns out to come from a feathered dinosaur rather than a bird. So this is the Archaeopteryx that wasn't. However, there were many Archaeopteryxes that were, and one of the most famous is the London specimen, which was found in the, one of the quarries locally and probably given to the local doctor in return for medical services. And so he got Hermann von Meyer to describe this specimen as well. And there was huge controversy about this because a lot of anti-Darwinists, it was right at the time when The Origin of Species was published, which was 1859, so two years before. So a lot of the, the scientists were trying to poo-poo the idea and say, no, this is, can't be a bird. This can't be evidence of evolution in birds. This has to be some kind of reptile. And in the end, one of the believers, which was Richard Owen, who coined the term dinosaur, he bought it for the Natural History Museum in London for 450 pounds. And apparently the money was used by Haberlein, this, this doctor, as a dowry for his daughter. So that's kind of nice that the Archaeopteryx paid for the wedding. So it's a lovely specimen in terms of the wings, but it, it's missing its head and neck, which should be up in here. And uh, it's nice that Darwin actually had a look at this specimen himself, and he said, that strange bird with a long lizard-like tail, it shows how little we as yet know of the former inhabitants of the world. So he was fascinated by this animal as well in terms of its evolutionary potential. After this, the next specimen that was found is probably the most complete specimen and possibly the most beautiful fossil in the world. It's been described this way. So this is the Berlin specimen. And you can see it's got these almost angelic style wings. This is the one that we have down here as well. So you can get a good idea of the size. And this was eventually sold to Haberlein's son, who was also a doctor, after being exchanged for a cow. So that's the price of an Archaeopteryx back in 1864. It's, a, it's basically a cow. So. Once Haberlein had this specimen, he was really struggling to sell it because a lot of people were still doubting about whether it was real, and he was asking for an awful lot of money. But some, of the, some museums were excited by it, so eventually it was bought by Berlin, the Berlin Museum, who outbid the Peabody Museum at Yale. And uh, it, it's now known to be a, a subspecies and probably not quite mature because the, the sternum, so this, this area here, is not fully ossified, so it hasn't quite turned to bone. And, and if, you, if you look at a juvenile chicken, you can actually bend the bones in the juvenile chicken before they really get kind of ossified and, and more bony. So lots of other specimens have turned up over the years since then, and not all of them have been quite as impressive as those two first specimens. So that, this is the Maxburg specimen. Each of these specimens is named after the museum where it's now located. And the quarry worker who found it actually thought it was a crayfish. So that gives you an idea of the style of preservation. So when you look at it, you can see it looks like a bit of a mess. So it's missing its head and tail. It's mostly disarticulated as well. And this belonged to a quarry owner, Edward Optich. And he, he was a, a famously bad-tempered man. And he tried very hard to sell this specimen for a lot of money. And he failed to sell it. And in the end, he took it away from the museum and put it under his bed and said, I'm not going to show it to anybody. And so when he died, 15 years after he took it out from the museum, they looked under his bed and the Archaeopteryx was gone. So this specimen is completely missing right now. And no doubt it's in somebody's private collection somewhere and they're not saying where it is. But all we have is a few casts to go on. This is the Harlem specimen here, which obviously is living in Holland right now. And it was originally described as a pterodactyl. It was actually the very first skeletal specimen that was found, but it was a pterodactyl until 1970 when John Ostrom had a look at it and he reclassified it. And they've actually realized that this is not an Archaeopteryx exactly. It's a, it's a related species called Ostromia. And what's interesting about this is that Ostromia is not thought to have had flight capabilities. So it lived further to the east and it's, this specimen was found further to the east and it couldn't have flown across to the islands and the lagoonal area where the rest of the Archaeopteryxes were found. And I've just shown this specimen here. This is re uh, the reason I'm showing you this one. It's the Burgermeister specimen. is because it's called the chicken wing. So that is the basically... Oh, sorry. This specimen here, is, that's all it is. It's just one wing. So you could almost imagine having that with, a I don't know, a little bit of a spicy sauce. I don't know what kind of chicken wings you, you like to have. But that's basically what we have there is just a chicken wing. So there's some more complete specimens that turned up as well, and I've already mentioned the Eichstatt specimen, which is a surprisingly small specimen here, but very similar, actually, in character to the, the Berlin specimen, except that the wings aren't as well preserved. And this was bought as a pterosaur by this guy, Meyer, who was a priest, 
and he realized there was an Archaeopteryx, and he had a crisis of conscience because he didn't want to put it on the market. He didn't know what to do, so he basically just stored it and hid it in his house until he died. So it's, it, it sat there for a long time before it was properly uh, analyzed, and the smallest known specimen, and it has the second best head, <laughs> if, if, you, if you want to classify best heads. I don't know who has the best head in this room. <laughs> Possibly this guy down here. And then the Solhofen specimen was originally classified as a dinosaur because it's very, the feathers on this specimen are very difficult to see and very, very poorly preserved. So, uh, and it's also an extremely large specimen as well. So that's the Solnhofen specimen. And then I'm just going to show you two more. This is the Munich specimen. And the, kind of, the nice story about this one is that the quarryman who found it saved all the slabs because it's on several different pieces. And he put all of the slabs aside, and when they put it back together, they had both halves, but they were missing a piece. And they went back to the area where he'd stored all of these blocks. And they went through something like 450 blocks that he'd put aside, and they found the rest of the specimen. So it's thanks to him. And his only reward, apparently, was a thank you, after which the quarry owner, who owned the specimen, sold it for 2 million Deutschmarks. So it's kind of nice that good old Jürgen, the, the quarryman, got a thank you. And then the Thermopolis specimen, which was found in 2005, is, uh, has been very valuable to us in terms of having the best preserved head, the best preserved feet, and some excellent plumage as well. So all, all of these fossils, they've provided us with different little tidbits of information to try and piece together what was going on with Archaeopteryx. So uh, this is not supposed to be a talk about classification and whether you want to lump these specimens together or split them into lots of different species. But basically, at the moment, the story is that we have Archaeopteryx lithographica, which was the London and Solhof specimens, and maybe some others, and Archaeopteryx siemensi, which will be the Berlin, the Munich, and the Thermopolis specimens. And if you want to try and subdivide some of the others, there are various other subdivisions as well, but really we can just stick to these two. So I've just shown some pictures of these two over there, and this is a, a diagram from a paper which shows the subtle differences between these different species if you want to go that way. So let's look at some of the preservation of some of these specimens and, that, and what that can tell us about them. So first of all, let's have a look at taphonomy. And taphonomy is the study of how animals get fossilized. And it's a really useful science because it gives us lots of information about behavior and about how things were going on at the time of deposition. So let's start off with the, the perfect example, this beautiful Berlin specimen. Fully articulated, complete skull and lower jaw. It's got that folded back neck that you see in so many of these specimens. And this probably drowned in a lake and only floated on the surface of the lake for a few hours before sinking to the bottom of the lagoon, where it was fossilized, basically lying like that. Another very complete specimen was that Solhofen specimen. So the, hard to see the feathers, but it was buried and almost completely articulated. So this also probably was, went into the water, into the lagoon, and sank pretty rapidly. Then we turn to the London specimen, and this had much more de decomposition. So it's missing a foot. I've put them in pink here. It's missing its head, which should be here. There's a few fragments of the, of the skull, but that's all. It's missing the claws down here. and. Uh, and yeah, the, the other foot here, so there's just one of the feet, the other, the other foot is missing there. And it's estimated, I don't quite know how they did this, but the, sci the scientists who studied this at the Natural History Museum estimated that it drifted for up to 27 days. So less than a month anyway, but it might, might have been less than that. So it was drifting around and the, and the ligaments were starting to break a little bit and then probably it was exposed for a further time on the lagoon bed. So that it's, that's, that's showing that there's definitely some real decomposition there. And then finally, the Munich specimen over here, which really is a mess. Once again, the, the head is missing here, but the skeleton's pretty much completely disintegrated. We've lost the skull, we've lost the cervicals, these, these ribs hurt here, and we've lost part of the hind limb. The rib cage is separated and jumbled across the body. And so this suggests that there was quite a lot of transport of this specimen before it was deposited. So it may, it may have died on the beach and then been washed out into the lagoonal system. So just to kind of the final bird bath, the final story, our bird dies initially. It probably floats on the surface of the lagoon, although this is not an Archaeopteryx, I should tell you. This is actually our, our national bird, the Canada goose. And then 
the, the bird eventually sinks to the bed of the lagoon, either in a nice complete state like this, if you're looking at the Berlin specimen, or in a more disarticulated state that, that would be more suggestive of something like the Munich specimen. It's then interred beneath microbial mats, so the mats would, the microbes and the bacterial mats would grow over the top of it, and they would encase it, basically, and protect it from being further, further um, decomposed. And then finally, you'd get more sediment that was deposited on top of it in this bottom diagram here, and that you would have no idea that there was even a fossil there unless you started splitting apart all of these blocks. So what about the skeletal features of this animal and what they can tell us? So first of all, I'm going to put, draw your attention to these two diagrams here, and you have, you have to tell me which one you think is the Archaeopteryx. Anybody want to have a guess? Top the top one. The top one is the Archaeopteryx. The top one has these longer arms, and it has much smaller peg-like teeth in its mouth. But otherwise, it's surprisingly similar to Deinonychus. So this is Deinonychus, one of our famous carnivores from the early Cretaceous, and very, very similar to Archaeopteryx. So they, they, it looks like they had a similar morphology, and possibly that they had quite a similar lifestyle. So our, our Archaeopteryx is around th 300 to 500 millimeters long, so this size, as we can see from the specimen. Magpie size, basically. The, and as far as the head goes, a light skull, narrow lower jaw with sharp teeth. The teeth are not serrated, so it's not like the, the, the kind of dinner, dinner knife or steak knife teeth that you see in a, in a carnivore, that the teeth are a bit more peg-like and a bit more simple than that, and probably would be used for grabbing rather than for cutting. Uh, and large eyes in our specimen, and we're going to see the comparison in a minute to show how big those eyes really were, which means that they're good for observation, good for hunting, possibly used at night. Short neck, air sacs in, the, in, in its body like modern birds, and then the limbs, three fingers on the hand, hind limbs very similar to our theropod down here, our meat-eating dinosaur, and then a hallux, this this little bone back, back here, like modern birds, suggesting that they had some kind of grip. The hallux is the bone at the back of the foot that helps with the grasping. So looking at the skulls, we can see that there's a really quite a strong similarity between our skulls here. So Dromaeosaurus over here on the right and Archaeopteryx on the left. Very similar in terms of kind of like the overall structure with these large fossa, these large holes in the skull. A big, even bigger eye socket in, the, in Archaeopteryx than in the Deinonychus. And obviously the teeth are a little bit different, but generally the overall structure is pretty similar between these animals. If we zoom in on the, the, bird, the bird brain here from our, 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 um, our Berlin specimen, you can actually see these little teeth down here. So what's happened with this specimen? The skull's almost complete. It's been compressed, so the bottom and upper jaw, the jaws have been squished together. The orbital socket here takes up a huge amount of the head and 14 millimeters in diameter with what's called a sclerotic ring, so the ring of bones there, rather like you see in something like an ichthyosaur as well, and then 12 peg-like teeth on each side of the mouth and uh, 12 on each side at the bottom of the mouth as well. And those teeth, as I said, are quite simple with a slight waist in the middle. The hands and feet so this is looking at the hand of our, uh, the Berlin specimen here, and you can see these really nice claws up here. So the forelimbs, beautifully preserved, three-fingered hands, and the fingers are not fused together like they are in a lot of modern birds. The hind limbs show some kind of torsion, so they've been a, bit, a little bit twisted in, in this Berlin specimen to the side. So the, the, the top part is like this, and the bottom part is like that. So that's, that's your Berlin specimen. And what we see here is they've got four claws, four, four toed feet with a, with a short, shorter first digit and then larger second and third digit. And then the, the claw arc of these, of these feet, so if you look at the angle that that makes, the, the amount of a circle that it makes, is about 120 degrees, which is very much like perching birds and not so much like a ground-dwelling bird. So that suggests that, first of all, that there were trees in this area and that the Archaeopteryxes were probably perching on them, at least for some of their lives. How about the wings? Well, the plumage in, in that, that Berlin specimen is incredibly well preserved, as we've already seen, with clear feather impressions on both wings, on the tail, on the legs, and on the base of the neck. And those feathers are preserved often on, on the part and counterpart. So both of the slabs, when they're broken open, you can see different aspects of the feathers on both halves. 
And the feathers are actually very, very similar to the magpie, which is of a similar size. So I've got this, these are not Archaeopteryx feathers, these are the magpie feathers, but they're very similar to what you would have seen in the fossil example. So we have the long tail feathers here, and as you can see, there's the tail of the magpie and the tail of our Archaeopteryx. Then we have the primary feathers, and we have the secondary feathers. And when you look at the numbers of these feathers, if you compare Archaeopteryx to magpies, you can see that even the numbers are pretty similar as well. So uh, magpie is not a bad thought to have in your head if you're thinking about what Archaeopteryx does look like. And in terms of the, the, the rest of the feathers on the body, specimen number 11, which I, I showed you guys earlier, shows feathers on the hind limbs as well. So these, as you can see, this is the leg of one of our Archaeopteryxes. And these are the feathers that are attached to the legs. So it's like it kind of had feather trousers. So this is a, a, a model here. And you can see that it's got these feathery kind of trousers on it. Very, very trendy. Um, what's interesting about these, these feather trousers is that they were originally on the Berlin specimen as well. But uh, they, they, the ch people who were preparing the specimen, and, and obviously the, the skeleton starts off completely encased in the limestone, they actually prepared off those leg feathers because they didn't realize that the feathers were there. So photographs from the 1890s show the leg feathers, but the leg feathers now on the modern specimen, like this one here, you can't see them anymore because they've actually been prepped off. And then another nice feature that you can see on, the, on this, uh, this specimen number 11 is that, that it's got this beautifully preserved tail. So we've seen tails on things like the Berlin specimen, but this one shows that they had this little kind of cleft in the middle of the tail here. So the tail was, had a kind of central parting, which was obviously to attract the mates. So one of the things that we've been able to do, because the specimens are different sizes, is that we can start estimating what the growth curves were like for these animals. So we go from the Eichstatt specimen here, the smallest specimen, up to the Solnhofen one. That's the one that you can't really see the feathers very well. And we've got a whole growth series in here as well. So they've been, uh, people who know more about these things than I do have put this together and made a kind of growth curve for these animals. And they've estimated that probably from baby to adult, juvenile to adult, took around three years before they, they achieved adulthood. And the growth rates are slower than the modern birds, so that the birds that can then stand soon after birth, so that animals that come out like, like chicks and things and, and uh, chickens, where the, the chicks come out of the egg, and they can stand pretty quickly. So three times lower growth rate than those, and a much lower growth rate than, than the helpless babies that, that hatch in nests like robins, but much higher growth rate than land reptiles. So it's kind of an interesting comparison here with the growth rates with those different species. So let's have a think about how these animals might have behaved. So first, the first big question to ask is, could Archaeopteryx fly? So... The feathers have a lower asymmetry than modern birds. And as we said, asymmetry is very important for flying. So the asymmetry maintains aerodynamic integrity because it help, allows the feathers to deform under loads and also it adds to lift. So there's some evidence that it could, it could have lift, but not as much with some modern birds. The wrist joints exhibit some features that are seen in modern birds. So the wrists themselves have some flexibility, but the shoulder joints are pretty stiff. So instead of having this beautiful flapping motion, which is going to look great on the video, they, had, they were pretty stiff. So they could kind of probably wobble around. So it suggests that maybe they were better at gliding than they were at actually flapping along. And they also had limited musculature. And we can estimate the musculature by looking at the bones and looking at the muscle scars on the bones. And it suggests that maybe at low speeds, they, they, you, they weren't able to do the flapping but they, they may have been able to flap at slightly higher speeds. So once they'd achieved some speed and they were flying along, then maybe they could have flapped their wings. So there's some, some thoughts that maybe they, they had a kind of running takeoff because they couldn't just flap and take off. They'd do a running takeoff rather like a grebe that you might see on a, in, a, in, a, in a lake. So they can running on water and gradually managing to get enough speed up that where they could take off. And if you look at the bones of Archaeopteryx and you plot them up against modern animals, that they plot closest to things like pheasants and turkeys. And I don't know whether any of you guys have seen a, a turkey or a pheasant flying, but they are not the world's most adept flyers. They're pretty messy in terms of uh, get, taking active flight. So I think that might be quite a good model for us to think about when we think about Archaeopteryx. 
And one of the other important things is that their, their brains were big enough for flying. So that because we've got these beautifully preserved skulls that we've been able to look at in three dimensions by scanning them, then we've, we've seen that the, the brain elements definitely give them enough kind of brain power to, to allow them to fly as well. And then a little bit of practical nature, they at least 12 specimens have been found in the middle of a lagoon. So how did they get into the lagoon? Were they all washed in from the sides, or were they just kind of flying along and then they just died in midair? So I don't think all of them necessarily would have been washed in from the sides. So that suggests that they had enough power, whether it was gliding or flying, to actually fly out over water and to be confident that they were flying while they were flying over water. Right, color. Great paper was published in 2012 by a chap called Carney, who found what he thought were mel melanosomes indicating black feathers. And melanosomes were uh, uh, they're the same thing that make, make us go dark in the summer in terms of um, tanning. And uh, there's some evidence when he looks at these microscopic structures, which may have been bacterial, but he thought that they were melanosomes, which suggested black feathers. And I put down here at the bottom, it's, it's interesting that dark feathers are actually stronger because of these melanosomes. So that would also help the archaeopteryx to have a more stable feather pattern. Other authors looked and they said, well, it looks a bit more like black and white based on the distribution of the organic sulfur within these. So you can imagine these, the, the scientists around the world are doing this painstaking observations on these, on these fossils. And the fossils are so valuable, it's not like you can scrape a little bit off to have a look at. This has all got to be done remotely. So they've done all of these studies to try and look at these. So unfortunately, that, that study, which, both of these studies here use that wing from 1861, which is a lovely idea. But as we now know, as of last month, that wing is not an Archaeopteryx wing. It's a dinosaur wing. So now we, we have a good idea that probably there were dinosaurs with black wings living at that time. So anyway, then they did a new analysis of two feathers from some of the other specimens. So from... Um, the, the specimen number 11 and the Thermopolis specimen, and they found that there were distinct black and white patterns on the bird's plumage, which might be comparable to the pigmentation on a magpie. So lighter in color with black tips to the wings. And this was partly based on traces of copper using a, a, a very fancy X-ray machine called the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source, which fortunately has been abbreviated. So that's where we stand right now, is that probably they look something like this. Uh, or even like this with just a, like a hint of, of lighter colors on them. But uh, yes, actually Archaeopteryx was mostly probably a blackbird. Right, how did they go about feeding? So there's lots of thoughts about feeding, and some people believe that they were just kind of like wandering around on, mostly on the ground, just picking up insects and things like that. But we, we know from what we've seen already that they were probably capable of gliding and possibly even flapping. So I like to think of them as a slightly more active predator. So they've got these giant eyes, and this is, a, this is a Archaeopteryx eye here with this sclerotic ring, so they're probably able to hunt at night as well. So you can imagine them flying around, and this one in the middle here is flying around and swooping down to capture a baby Compsognathus that was just making his way along the forest floor. And then we have another one here that theoretically could be attacking and, and catching a frog. So it's likely that they had quite a variety of diets, maybe reptiles, amphibians, mammals, insects, and seized their prey with the jaws, because the jaws had these kind of biting teeth rather than really incising teeth, and maybe using the claws to help to pin down larger prey. And then we have to think a little bit outside the box. We don't really know what's going on. Could they have done something more like black herons when they you know, used their wings as a, as a way of shading the water while they were catching fish in the water as well on the margins of these lagoons. So the, the jury is out. We don't know. We don't have a lot of evidence. But certainly from the anatomical evidence, it seems that they were active predators rather than scavengers. And then I, I was out running the other day and uh, along the, the Bow River and I saw a magpie having a bath, and I, I kind of had in my mind about magpies and archaeopteryxes being the same size, and I thought, well, you can't prove any of this, but this is all ways that archaeopteryx may have behaved. I mean, they, they had to do, they had to live their lives. So first of all, they had to make nests, so it's likely that the archaeopteryxes were carrying nesting material in their mouths, and most likely they were nesting on the ground. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to suggest that they were making fancy nests in the trees, 
although we don't have any fossil evidence either way, but most of the dinosaurs are used, making these mounds on the ground, so that's probably what they were doing. They were probably having the odd bath here and there, and this is what I saw a magpie doing the other day. They may have been fighting with each other. They may have been feeding on parasites, much like egrets do on the backs of uh, cattle or, or hippopotamuses. Uh, they may have been sharing food, they may have been fighting over food, and there may even have been a little bit of uh, naughty business going on as well. Which, but unfortunately, because of the lack of terrestrial evidence from this area, because all of the fossilized sediments are from this lagoonal and marine environments, we don't actually know what's happening to their behavior until we find something with some terrestrial traces. So some trace fossils, trace evidence from land that might show some of these activities. I just wanted to show you a couple of pictures of some of the associated fauna because it's great to look at Archaeopteryx, but Archaeopteryx did not live in isolation. There were a lot of other animals living around at the same time. And thanks to the Solnhofen limestone, we have this incredible preservation. So there's plenty of evidence for the insects that it might have been eating. I've got this dragonfly here, but there's lots of other insects. There are lots of shallow marine organisms, lots of um, arthropods, so shrimps, crabs, lobsters. There were jellyfish. There were echinoderms, like these ones, and ammonites as well. And in fact, one of the specimens, the, one of the most recent specimens that's been found, which is known as the new specimen, which was found three years ago, that actually has an a, a ammonite fossilized on the same slab as the Archaeopteryx. And this is just to show this dendritic pattern. This is, this is manganese um, mineralization, and this has helped to preserve some of these fossils and to, to preserve the, the structures on the, on the surface of the fossils. Then there are vertebrates as well, and these are just a mix of vertebrates. So we have some lizards here, we have a lot of fish here as well, and we have one dinosaur, just one dinosaur, which is this Comsognathus. So this is, it, we're, we're in a more marine environment. It's not like many dinosaurs have been washed out into these lagoons. We've just got that one apart from our Archaeopteryx, which you could possibly describe as dinosaurs as well. And then I just wanted to zoom in on these pterodactyls because they are just some of the most incredibly preserved animals. Quite a few of our archaeopteryxes started their lives as pterodactyls before they realized about the plumage, so that some of them were misidentified. And this example here is what, something that I mentioned earlier where this fish, this ganoid fish, has been swimming along and it's caught this pterodactyl in its jaws, but then obviously swum into one of these toxic areas and just died. So it's literally fossilized in the process of trying to eat itself some lunch. So I'm just going to summarize by saying that uh, Archaeopteryx may no longer be the oldest bird. We've now got evidence going back about another 14 to 16 million years, mainly from China, that there were birds even older than this specimen. But it's still an iconic fossil that heralded the world of birds and has really brought people's attention to the fact that the, the lineage of birds goes back so far in history. It's inspired the imaginations of generations of dinosaur enthusiasts, including Darwin, as we saw earlier, Richard Owen, and Cuvier. So some of the most famous minds in the world have worked over these specimens. It shows a fascinating combination of reptilian and bird features with the teeth, claws, bony tail, lack of beak, and ventral ribs that you would associate with a dinosaur, but also the plumage, the wishbone, and the backwards directed pubis, which have clearly had bird affinities. And in addition to that, the, the gradual changes in the style of the skulls of birds. So this is an Archaeopteryx, and this is a chicken here. It was using neoteny, beginning to use neoteny. So this is where, instead of evolving and growing up, features of your body stay in an infant state to allow you to develop more fully. So humans do this as well. Babies' heads, are, they, they, your baby's head develops at a different rate to the rest of the body to allow your brain to develop further than it would in monkeys. So it's using this kind of evolutionary techniques to, to make it uh, have a, more, a skull that's more suitable for bird activities. So it's completely impossible to put a value on fossils like this Berlin specimen, but I would say that certainly there's something like this, if this was the original, we would be worth $50 million, something like that. Far more valuable than boring old Sue, the Ty Tyrannosaurus rex. And I would say that this remains the world's most famous bird. So we have much left to learn about this animal, but we do know one thing, and that it never ever misses breakfast, because it's the early bird that catches the worm. <laughs> Thank you.
wants to ask John about his presentation. Um, I see in some of the illustrations uh, there is the lifted inner toe similar to an ankle wrap, for instance, and some illustrations it doesn't have it. What's the evidence on their actual foot structure? Um, I, I don't think there's any evidence for the lifted toe in the middle, but definitely the, the first toe, the primary toe, is shorter than the other two. So it has three forward pointing toes on the foot. And of those, the first one, the one on the inside, is shorter than the others. But I've, I've never seen any evidence from the fossils. It's more the fact that when they're flattened down, when those three, three forward-facing toes are flattened down, that usually what happens is that one of them goes above the other one. Just like if you squished our feet from the sides, then that, that would happen as well. But I haven't seen any evidence that it's actually raised like this. So I don't, I don't, I don't think that's the case. Good question, though. Yes? So, so it's, that, that's also a really good question. So I go back to that, that horseshoe crab that we saw, and the, the horseshoe crabs and the death spiral. So the traces are almost completely absent in this lagoonal setting. So normally you're going to get a lot of feeding traces from snails that are wandering around on the, on the lagoon bed. You'll get um, lots of worms and things that are living in, inside the, the sediment. And because we've got these really finely layered sediments as well, all of those should be preserved. And we basically don't see any of those at all. So there's almost no evidence that anything was able to survive there. And, and apart from those death spirals of, of a couple of horseshoe crabs that have wandered in, you don't see any trace fossils. So I think we can be pretty confident that nothing apart from the bacteria was able to live down there. Does the animals that they are finding would have wandered in from the wider seas? Yes, yeah. And they actually think that a lot of these animals were washed in during storms. So you'd have a kind of influx of storm waters uh, and almost instantaneous, you know, like you might wash in a, a jellyfish or something like that, and it would ju the jellyfish would just l immediately be kind of subsumed into this highly saline, toxic waters, and it would just be kind of preserved there and nothing could get to it. Yes, at the back. Speaking about the future of discovery at this um, line, uh, the stone was used for lithographs many, many years ago. Yes. Um, only marginally, Darren. Marginally. Yeah. And how many people use this stone today for lithographs, given yeah. the digital world? So there's a, there's a vanishingly small number of people who think that they should still be doing that. And my, my brother, I don't know whether you, any of you guys know, but my brother is a, is a heraldic artist. So he draws grants of arms and when people get knighted on calf skin. But he's one of only eight people in the world who does that. So it, it, it is a very small industry, and lith lithography is about the same. But what the, most, the last three specimens that have been found have been found by collectors. So they allow collectors to go into, the, into the, all the quarries. They're still, most of the quarries are still open. And the collectors are the ones splitting these layer, layer by layer by layer. And, and it, that, that there's still a much smaller amount of, of stone being processed. But that, 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 I think, is our best opportunity to find more specimens. Yeah. As far as I know, so I, I haven't been there for about, I went there about um, probably nearly 20 years ago. So it's good that this T-shirt has lasted. But uh, I was there a while ago. And, and when I was in the quarry, it was on a, it was on a weekday, and there were probably 40 people collecting. And the quarry was about the size of four or five soccer pitches together, and there was lots of material there for splitting. So I don't know whether they're actually going in and occasionally bulldozing it. Uh, the, some of the quarries, are, I think a couple of the quarries are still active, so they are still using a little bit of this stone. But uh, I think, yeah, the, the level of activity is much less, but at least there's a lot of people collecting and looking for material. And when you go there, I mean, everyone's excited they might find an archaeopteryx, but the one thing you do find a lot of is these little crinoids. They're called sacoma, and they're, they're only about a centimeter across, but there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them in the quarries. So they, they kind of give you a little bit of hope that you might find something else. But yeah, I, yeah, the chance of finding more is small, but not impossible. Yeah, there's another question here. I just want to make sure I'm imagining this right from what you said. It would have been sort of a death lagoon with lots of little forested jungle islands and occasionally a lot of dead sea life floating in. 
Yes. Is this why we're finding all of the flying animals for the red earthy objects in the lagoon? Is it possible to see all these dead fish floating there? Like, oh, that's the wind that's coming in and making that as well? Yeah, I would have thought that was an excellent, excellent chance of that happening. Because yeah, there, there are a lot of pterosaurs in there. There's, uh, Archaeopteryx could not have been a very abundant animal at that time because we don't find many of the fossils, but hundreds of pterosaurs have been collected from this. So yeah, I think that's, I, I hadn't actually thought about that, but yeah, it's almost like bait. You send the fish in, the fish die, and then the, the, everyone else comes zooming in to try and grab them, and then they end up getting poisoned as well. Yeah, good. Another great and highly interesting talk to present you with the 2019 <laughs> <laughs> Memorial Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. And I'd like to invite you to uh, come back next week. Next week we'll have Dr. Suzanne Kouti from the University of Calgary. We'll be talking about, I think it's Pliocene apes that live in Eastern Africa at the same time that the ancestors of humans evolved. So if you want to know more about uh, what type of monkeys, apes, and maybe even early human ancestors lived in Eastern Africa, I'd like you to come back. And if you want to come have a look at the cast or ask John more questions, please feel free to come down. Thanks. Thanks, Francois. Great talk. <laughs>